Um, Josh Stack is going to take us um, into our first plenary, and he and his dad, Kevin, are the owners and operators of Northeast Green Building Consulting. Josh refers to himself as a recovering attorney. After spending time uh, doing tax law, he decided to return to his roots, uh, which were building in his life and, and biology uh, academically and apply the, his knowledges and interests to uh, biomimicry and sustainable building design. So Josh, take it away with Green Building Today. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm between this podium for the filming, but uh, if you can't hear me over there, let me know and I'll try to speak a little bit louder into the microphone. I also heard beer at uh, 3.15, and I will not be the guy that stands in the way of that. And I know we're getting a little bit late of a start, so I'll move a, I'll move a little bit quick. I think we have a small enough group. If anybody wanted to ask a question or um, to clarify anything as we move through the presentation, go ahead. Or um, we'll have some Q&A at the end. Um, so yeah, I am a recovering attorney. Uh, I was born into a family construction business, which I think anybody here who is a builder, a small family business like ours, um, you know, child labor laws don't apply, um, and you're kind of just born into it. So I kind of learned on a construction site first before I went out and uh, got educated. And I've been back uh, building houses with dad and, um, you know, supporting design and other initiatives and sustainability for the past 10 to 12 years. So that's a photo that we see too often today, I think, in the news. All the hurricanes, uh, Sandy, Katrina. Um, you know, all these unprecedented storms, you know, rare storms that um, you see one in 500 years or coming one in 100 years or even more than one in 100 years. And so, you know, I love to talk to builders and designers and architects because we're all ultimately the ones responsible for what we build on that site, how that responds to any disturbance, how it responds to any storm, uh, whether the people stay safe inside or not. Um, but we actually have to do it. You know, we can talk about it, and um, conferences like this are great, and I love this conference because it is about how to do it. It's not just about thinking about it, but at the end of the day, we have to go onto a site and make some decisions and build something. But, so the trick with this photo is that's actually not after a natural disaster. That is a construction site of a green project at a university that's uh, motto is the oldest university in the United States devoted exclusively to the study of the natural environment. And so 18 houses got demolished to make way for a university dorm that was certified after. Um, that happened. And so, you know, this happens probably 300,000 times a year on average. There's enough waste, um, and these figures are probably before the construction industry collapsed in 2008, but um, enough waste to make a 30-foot wall uh, 30 feet high, 30 feet wide around the lower continental United States each year. So an amazing amount of waste and resources that just end up landfilled. And that's a decision-making process in construction, budget and schedule. We're all subject to it. We all know it very, very well. Uh, budget especially, but schedule too. And so this sort of thing happens. So what I want to talk is a little bit about process, a little bit about decision-making. When you come to a project, there's not always an opportunity to think differently, uh, you know, for a lot of different reasons. But this is what we came up with when we first started to ask what green building and sustainable construction was. And there's two different ways you can talk about it. It's either uh, scientific ecological knowledge, basically the sciences of ecology, the sciences of physics, which um, in building science is doing fantastic things with. Um, you know, in terms of wall assemblies, I'm sure Conrad will go through some really um, great examples and Mike and others about you know, building science for our structures. But what I want to talk about is ecology. Uh, building science is a lot bigger than just building physics and just a lot bigger than the laws of thermodynamics. So you can talk about it scientifically. Um, you know, on the uh, left, just a few statements. But basically to say the site is the template for design. When you step onto a site, uh, you know, the standard process is uh, you, you bulldoze a lot of life, a lot of other species off the site. Uh, at least, you know, down our way, that's the standard subdivision in, uh, you know, the agricultural community that I'm from. And then you dig a big hole and you build something. But um, a lot of that's missed about what we're actually doing to the site when we step on and begin to, to the design and construction process. Or even the design process in terms of, you know, house siting or, or building siting, whatever it might be. But on the left, 
it's, it's something that you know, our ancestors and ancient um, civilizations knew a long, long time ago. And so that quote from the lower right in that drawing actually comes from the world's oldest living democracy, which is located about 30 minutes south of Syracuse. It's the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Yanadaga Nation. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but they have different values. So when we step onto a site with how we build, you know, how we believe we should build has ecological consequences. It's not just, um, not just theory. So that's my son probably headed off to cause some trouble. But the, the question is, what sort of world are we going to make for him by how we build our houses and our communities? It's a little bit different up here in the Adirondacks because there's still a lot of you know, wild places, still a lot of nature, um, natural systems. Where I come from, it's mostly agricultural, very different. But the big thing when I started to research this 10 years ago is we've grown so much, we've become a geologic force, which is to say, that graph basically says it all. The x-axis is age. It's basically human history, and you can kind of see some of the, the big markers that it, we've attained as a species. But the big point is that little, uh, little red oval is basically all of recorded history. But for our purposes, it's any way of design or construction that we know, whether it's passive house or lead for homes or basic codes, whatever it might be, evolved within that variability. So we're talking temperature, we're talking all the things that come with changes in temperature, rainfall, uh, freeze-thaw, I mean, you name it. But prior to that period, which started about 10,000 years ago, called it the Holocene. It was a period of stability. And so everything we've built is within that stability. So when we talk about you know, durability on a site or you know, 100-year structure or whatever it might be, we've built within that little bubble. And the key consequence of becoming a geologic force is that we've actually shifted the Earth at a global level, but also locally, as we're seeing, and you know, the big one that I'm sure everybody knows about is climate change that is talked about. That's really only one of a bunch of variables. And, and this group that's come up with this graph, there's some really great videos online about it that, that um, discuss it more, is you know, that's only one of nine potential variables, you know, kind of thresholds that if you cross, you, you enter a different uh, world, so to speak. And so climate, you know, they say is one of the easiest to solve. Another one that's more difficult is, um, you know, biodiversity loss. I'll talk about that next. But the photo behind that graph is actually um, two professors from the University of Maryland. He called it anthropogenic biomes. And that is looking at the, the ecosystem that you build within, but accounting for the human pressure on it. So where I'm from is a small agrarian village next to a lake about 40 minutes east of Syracuse. If you look at that on a biome map, it would say it's an eastern forest. But if you drive there, it's certainly not an eastern forest. It doesn't look anything like the Adirondack forest. It looks like a bunch of cow pastures and cornfields and houses and subdivisions. Um, so kind of the, the nature that we knew it no longer exists. The, and so the other big thing is it's about change and how we're going to respond as builders to the sort of change that's coming at us with climate and others. So really quickly, um, since we're, we started a little bit late, um, you know, we're at a point where uh, you know, it started with the industrial era when we shifted geologic time. And the conclusion is the next few generations hold greater influence on future generations, my son, my kids, your kids, your grandkids, um, you know, than ever before. And so the question is, as builders, designers, architects, how can we intervene, how can we design to at least return it back maybe to the stability that the Holocene or build a good future going forward. Um, so one of the other big consequences of being a geologic force is we've actually triggered the sixth great extinction event. It's the first since the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And you know, that seems abstract. It seems kind of um, you know, maybe a little vague, hard to relate to. But when you think about how and why we, we became a geologic force and, and how we're causing this extinction event, it's how we design our buildings and, and build our buildings, our, our systems of transportation and agriculture. It's how you know, the standard building practice is to go on a site to clear a subdivision, uh, erase the ecology that was there, you know, dig some holes, hopefully put up some energy efficient houses. But you know, even with energy efficiency, that's a photo of the um, Appalachian Mountains the world's most biologically diverse freshwater ecosystem in the world. 
one of the oldest ecosystems. And so that's mountaintop coal removal. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's heard about that, but more than 500 mountaintops have been, basically that you blow the top of the mountain off to get to a very narrow seam of coal, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 feet down. You take the coal, you scrape the rest of the mountaintop off, you push it into valley, and um, you know, the communities down there are being affected. And so I guess, you know, here thankfully you guys have uh, regulatory and legal protections, but you know, instead of uh, being a 46 or imagine if you were a fiver or a tenor, because the coal companies are allowed to come up here and blow the tops off if say coal did exist. So, you know, it has a profound impact on how you would build in response to that when you're at the bottom of that mountain and the top of that mountain is blown apart and pushed into the stream, your water's followed. So, you know, our clients all expect certain basic functions when you build them a house, right? Shelter, warmth, cooling, uh, fresh water, uh, you know, not really food, but it's kind of going that way with um, agriculture. But so the, the key is, you know, as a geologic force, as, um, you know, the, the force of change in the world, we're accountable to some extent. How, are, how we design our cities and communities causes this. And so that's a consequence. And, and the big thing is, for us, it's a loss of adaptive solutions. Um, diversity of you know, both biological systems but also cultural systems provides opportunity in times of change. And so now that we're triggering this change in the world of almost unprecedented scale, um, we're losing that source of adaptive solutions that has evolved over the past 10,000 plus years. So you can measure it um, on a local level. This is a study from about 1,400 ecologists worldwide. They looked at ecosystem health and its consequences on human well-being. The key metric here that we actually use for our sites is ecosystem services. And that is basically the free services of nature that we take for granted. Water purification, climate stability, soil fertility for agriculture, uh, you know, how our marshes purify water, for example. And so those are the four conclusions on the left. Basically modified living systems uh, faster and more extensively in the last 50 years than ever before. That's the great acceleration, basically, of consumption. We consumed a lot more resources a lot faster as we grew. Um, you know, we take about 40% of the food resource that's available in any terrestrial system. So we're one species of about 10 to 100 million species in the world, but we consume anywhere from 30 to 40% of the food that's available on, you know, on a terrestrial ecosystem. That's the first time any species has done that in about 400 million years. And so, you know, when scientists look back to see what that world might look like 50 to 100 years from now, they're not going back 10,000 years or 20,000 years, they're going back 50 million years and trying to figure out what sort of functions and variables that, that system might have. And so the important thing there is, you know, it's all about function. It's all about ensuring the existence of a healthy functioning system. A house is a, is a system, um, you know, with key functions that, like I said, our clients expect us to provide. Um, the rest of the conclusions are there, but the big one is you can no longer assume that ecosystems will provide the same level of services that they have in the past that we rely on for free. You know, economists, uh, whatever stock you put in uh, economic valuation, have said the value of those services is $33 trillion. So when you eliminate those services, somebody's got to pay to restore those. For example, in the city of Syracuse, where we do a lot of consulting, the city of Syracuse actually used to be a swamp. It used to be a marsh mosaic of uh, different, you know, beach hardwood, uh, hemlock swamps. And then you know, about 200 years ago, you know, right around the beginning of the uh, human-dominated period, the Anthropocene, we filled the swamp as a community for salt production. And when we did that, we eliminated that natural system's ability to purify stormwater. And so fast forward 150 years, the city and the county are under a consent order judgment from a federal court to purify Onondaga Lake. It never would have happened if we hadn't, as a community, gone in and eliminated that historic ecology. That ecology was managing the stormwater forests. It was doing a lot of other good stuff like fresh air production. But when you go in and, and just basically wipe that slate clean and put the human community on top of it, when you eliminate those key functions, it costs a lot to repair and a lot to restore. Um, and that's what we're going to be looking at as builders over the next, you know, the, the near future. So that's just to talk thresholds. That photo is um, from New Jersey and Sandy. A fire came through. And if you think about you know, any community or a house in terms of key functions and feedbacks and structures, the house, you know, that system on the upper uh, left 
might still have running water, may still have electricity, may still have some basic functions that um, you know, residents could shelter in place through the storm. The one on the lower right is just, you know, you can measure functionally how that system is, and it's certainly not uh, anything that we could uh, inhabit as, you know, they, they do the reconstruction down that way. And so when I prepared for the talk, read a lot about the recent landslides that have happened up here and issues with stormwater when sites are cleaned. It's the same sort of, sort of thing that we, we've seen south in Syracuse and elsewhere, that when you go in and you eliminate the natural ecology on a site, you create stormwater management issues, which create costs and headaches for builders and designers. Um, and so just the graph on the upper left, uh, you know, as we're driving this change on a global scale, you know, that's a graphic of the state of New Hampshire. They estimate mid this century, late this century, the climate, the temperature, the rainfall, the variability of New Hampshire is going to look a lot more like North Carolina. You know, I, a lot of this is based on complex mathematical modeling, so I'm not sure how much I um, trust it, other than to know that whatever the climate of New Hampshire looks like in 50 to 100 years is pretty much unpredictable and, and is unknown. And um, same goes for here, and, and the houses we build today are going to have to adjust and accommodate that sort of thing. So we ended up you know, looking at that and realizing resilience. And resilient science was probably one of the best frameworks we could find in terms of how to build houses. And so resilience is basically the capacity to manage change and preserve key functions, structures, and feedbacks. Again, same sort of thing we expect our houses and cities and um, agricultural systems and, and transportation systems to do. We expect a certain level of functioning from those systems. And when they fail, you get the call in the middle of the night that the heating system's out or there's a leak or whatever. Um, but so resilience is about preserving the existence of function. And so green building today is a lot about efficiency, which is, um, I think, a vital first step. It, it's absolutely critical um, to, to consume more efficiently. But efficiency in isolation, when you optimize one part of a system, and we've learned that with building science, when uh, you, know, you, you look at just an HVAC system or a more efficient HVAC system without looking at the envelope, and, and realizing you should probably air seal and insulate before you purchase new windows or before you put an HVAC system in. When you, when you try to optimize something in isolation, you create consequences elsewhere. And so if we try to optimize just for efficiency in our buildings, even you know, uh, passive house or net zero energy or whatever it might be, and we don't account for the rest of the system, we're going to create a lot of vulnerability and exposure for ourselves elsewhere. So, you know, I think it's as simple as this. E.O. Wilson is um, the world's uh, probably leading biodiversity researcher based at, Harvard, based at Harvard. And so he coined the term the death of birth for the sixth great extinction event because for him it's not about losing just biodiversity and species, it's losing genetic diversity. He believes, you know, we'll eventually lose entire ecosystems, we'll lose entire ecological niches. It's big, um, first time in 65 million years. It's a huge, huge loss. It's a huge functional loss, um, not just um, you know, an argument for whether a species should exist for its own right or for, uh, you know, intrinsically has a right to exist. It has you know, key adaptive solutions and key benefits for our species. Um, but so that's what he proposes as a solution. Basically, if you save the living environment, you automatically save the physical environment. But if you only focus on the physical environment, you'll lose both. And so that's just to recognize that life is you know, as fundamental as, say, the sun, as, you know, the soil, as everything else. And life creates, you know, basically the conditions we, we rely on for survival. The way he puts it, we're a biological species immersed in a very thin layer of biological life. We rely on that biological community, the soil and everything else to provide for our well-being, to take our resources from, to build our houses with. And so... Um, if we only look at carbon, for example, and count carbon in buildings and try to reduce carbon, you know, E.O. Wilson would say we'll lose both the living and the physical. But if we try as builders, when we step on a, a site, to measure, the bio, say, the biodiversity before and after and determine whether we enhance the biodiversity or not, you know, then if we start to preserve or enhance the living environment, that environment will most likely take care of us. Um, so this is the site of one of our most recent projects. It... Uh, Brownfield on a pond that was in the last stage of succession filling itself in just upstream. West of that is a 400 acre wetland with endangered and threatened species that um, you know, rely on that pond basically for its well-being. That pond actually connects to, I believe, Oswego Lake. 
but it's a key, it's a key um, component of the local watershed. So we had a 25-acre site. Client said, it's not about affordability, it's not about budget, just tell me what sustainability is and build it. And um, so the first thing we do is look back. And we found that the original builders, that actually used to be a wet forest about 150 years ago. And the original builders came in, they, they put a dam in, and they actually, um, I'm not sure if they dug the pond or just dammed it, but they dammed it for a mill, so energy and resource production. And they also dammed it to create ice um, for sale. So the original people that stepped on that site 150 years ago did it in a way that actually enhanced the biodiversity of that site. They created that pond. In the intervening 150 years, a bunch of different species came in uh, and created a very rich and vibrant community. It was about to fail. Um, you know, it's a green building today. Even LEED would say, don't go within 100 feet of a wetland. Um, on this project, we submitted an interpretation that said, hey, I think we can do better with this pond. It's in the last days of succession. It's going to fill itself in. It's going to, a lot of the species that rely on it are going to um, disappear. And in terms of fresh water and some of the other benefits the homeowners want, they'd rather see a nice pond in the backyard than a, than a wet forest. And so it was kind of good from a client perspective, but also a, a living system uh, perspective. So that's what we ended up with. Um, we can talk about some of the metrics there on the upper right. Um, so what we try to do is enhance adaptive capacity. That's just to say what we try to do is create a diversity of opportunity for residents in the future. So functionally, what we try to do is, is build a lot of different ways that house and that system can achieve the same levels of function that that uh, family is going to rely on in terms of water purification. You know, you can take from the pond. There was an old well on site which we preserved. It's also connected to the municipal system. So there's at least three different sources of water. You know, there's a gray water reclamation and reuse system in it, stormwater capture from about 78 to 80 percent of the roof. Uh, the site we actually did irrigate, even though we're in a of about 40 inches of rainfall per year and 121 inches of precipitation. We did that because of the variability that's going to come and the unknown of what that system is going to look like over the next 50 to 100 years. What sort of rainfall, if it's going to be more intense or less intense, but the way we designed it was, you know, all the species that were planted on site, um, you know, rainfall alone can take care of the irrigation needs in any drought, um, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. So we're not relying on municipal water. We're not even drawing water from the pond. We're just capturing rainwater from the sky, storing it in a series of loosely connected cisterns with some pumps to pump it back and forth to kind of put it where the need might be. But so that's how we do it. The first thing we do is remember what was there. So we do some research at the local historical association. It takes time, but it's free otherwise. Uh, talk to local professors at universities about what they might know about what the, the ecosystem should have looked like or, or what it should look like going forward. Um, and then we try to just find different ways uh, at low cost to put redundancy back into the system, uh, diversity back into the system. But the key is not just redundancy or diversity because, you know, when you talk efficiency, anytime you talk redundancy, it's an extra cost. And clients, well, why, why should I have to pay for that if I've got, you know, a 99.5% AFUE efficient furnace? Why would I need, you know, passive survivability or an enhanced thermal envelope or why would I need a fireplace or why would I need some other source of heat if um, you guys do your job right and you come fix it when it breaks. Um, so it's a conversation, but you, so you look at diversity at structural and functional levels. So we tried to repair the ecosystem structure and the ecosystem function. And there's scientific you know, measurements, quantifiable, that you can put on those and you can know whether you're doing a good job or not. You talk to consulting ecologists or landscape ecologists and, and you get a, an assessment and you, go, you take it from there. So that's just to say um, the first thing we do is remember. And the, the example that kind of hammers at home, I think for me at least, is um, if you think about a fire in a forest, that, fu that fire starts at you know, a very small patch, expands up at larger scales of the forest. But as long as that forest isn't burned completely and that seed bank destroyed, that seed bank will remember, will renew the system after that change, after that disturbance. So, same thing goes with our buildings. When we look at our buildings, the first thing we try to do is remember. This is actually a photo of um, a 12.4 million pound hotel in the city of Syracuse uh, from 1922. The builders here actually picked this building up, deconstructed the stone foundation, moved it across the street, spun it 180 degrees, and then set it back down on its original uh, stone foundation. They did it over the course of three months 
And the, the funny thing about it was the guests checked in and out during the whole period. There was no interruption of services. And so imagine a client, you know, we do mostly residential construction, not commercial, but imagine a client coming in and saying, hey, I want to move this building across the street. I mean, apart from the embodied energy that is present in that building, you know, millions and millions of gallons of gasoline is an equivalent, for example. It, it would take for brick, uh, you know, to, to go mine those resources today. So, and, and also at a great cost of destruction to the living system, but I can't even conceive a client coming and asking us to do that today. I'm sure there's larger firms that could do that, but you know, the memory of that's lost. No one in Syracuse remembers that actually happened because two decades after they moved it, the uh, city decided to demolish it and put a parking lot in for a new hotel. So it, apart from the cultural, you know, it was a luxury hotel, so I'm sure the interiors were beautiful. I'm sure it was a craftsmanship, a level of craftsmanship and, and materials that you probably can't even harvest anymore because they're old growth or illegal to harvest from systems, and they're just in a landfill somewhere right now. I would assume. Maybe they ground that back up for road base. You know, I honestly don't know. But um, so you have to remember, because a lot of the times the, uh, you know, and I'm not saying anything new to you guys, I know, but, you know, the most valuable person on a construction site is usually the old guy who has been there for a long time, who has a tool you've never seen before to solve exactly the challenge you need. And it's not a tool you have to plug in. It, and it's, um, you know, and that's what the knowledge that we're losing today. You know, the average construction worker, I think, is 55 years old. And so that experience, that knowledge that we're losing, is going to be pretty profound as we go forward um, for us younger guys of what we, what we don't know. Um, so we try to do it on a smaller scale. We look at deconstruction. 50% of any wood product is carbon by weight. So it's carbon sequestration, which... Um, you know, when people think about sustainability today, it's mostly carbon counting and carbon account and uh, carbon inventorying. So you could actually deconstruct these houses and sell carbon credit for them if you wanted to on um, markets. So you don't get any real money for it. But, you know, the point is, it is actually carbon sequestration. It, you, and if you use, say, building science techniques to prove that if you deconstruct this house and then you build a house next to it using a, approved building science techniques that could be a 100, 200, 300 year structure, you've sequestered that carbon. You haven't had to step into another forest to harvest new materials. Um, so you combine deconstruction with things like advanced framing techniques where you don't put lumber where there is no real load. And you can save you know, tens of thousands of acres of forest each year. And you can still go in and harvest timber from those lands, but you can reduce the pressure. And you can start to manage them for multiple purposes rather than just um, you know, timber production, for example. So this house weighed about 213,000 pounds. We salvaged 86% um, of it. There was no real memory of deconstruction in the city of Syracuse, but if you go into the old houses and buildings around um, the city, you can see examples of it everywhere. And we saw a church uh, from 1833 that had burned in about 1850, and the first thing the builders did was pick up the beams from the ashes and reuse what they could and reframe. And so we, we were up into the barrel vault, and you could see the charred beams of where they just said, hey, it's a lot easier to pick up this beam out of the ashes, and it's still good. I don't have to go into the forest to cut and fashion a uh, six by six out of, because I've got a good one sitting right here. But I think with cheap fossil fuel and um, bigger machines and bigger technology, it just became faster and cheaper and easier to scrape buildings like this from the site, make them disappear and start over. Um, so to talk budget and schedule on this one, it was $1,000 more expensive than demolition, but we salvaged uh, $2,000 worth of materials. If you discount those materials at 50% uh, like the Habitat for Humanity Restore does in, in Syracuse. But actually what happened with that house was there was a lot of 4x4s and 4x6s, stuff that we never expected would have absolutely any value whatsoever when you look at that house. It was built, I think, 1916, uh, about 2,000 square feet. Again, it weighed about 214,000 pounds. But, you know, it's a humble shotgun house. There, you didn't, there's no architectural salvage. There's no stained glass windows. There's no fireplace mantles. We didn't think there was anything of value. And then we kind of took the lumber that we deconstructed to a, uh, a local mill that we knew, a guy who, um, you know, deconstructs barns and turns them into flooring. He made uh, engineered flooring product out of that. And I'm, I'm talking to builders, so you guys know the cost of different flooring choices. And salvaged wood flooring is probably the most expensive. It, especially if you compare it against cork or bamboo or even, say, local oak. Um, so, and the other thing that was made was a, a complete kitchen. And so before the talk, I emailed the kitchen maker and said, hey, what'd you sell that kitchen for? It was $15,000. So, 
It's not just the value of the two by four that comes out sold at 50%. It's what you can take with these materials. Um, it's also economic development um, in cities like Syracuse. You know, a lot of people are unemployed. Um, we had 19 people on the site for three days. Six of them were from a disadvantaged construction company that wanted to learn building science. The best way to learn building science is to take apart a structure that failed to see why, you know, say window detailing or whatever, um, why, where, why and where and how moisture intruded, why that structure has to be deconstructed, why it wasn't built properly to begin with. You can do inventories, you develop a cut list, same thing you do as when you construct a new house, develop a cut list, you look at these old ones. Uh, so it teaches the same skills that you need for building science and sustainable construction um, careers going forward. Um, it's profitable for communities because, you know, we salvaged 186,000 pounds of it, about 86%. So that's, um, you know, a lot that didn't go to a landfill. That's less landfills a community has to create and maintain and then close. Um, you know, a lot of benefit to it. And it, that was probably five or six years ago, and we still can't convince the city to even release, um, and I'm being recorded here, so I should be uh, a little cautious, but um, to, to give deconstruction an equal, equal opportunity, um, just because we forgot that we once just deconstructed because it was probably the easier way to do it. Um, you know, the original bid uh, on this was, well, I guess I'll leave it there. Uh, so you can just, we'll you know. We'll cut it out. We'll edit it out. Okay. Excellent. I promise. <laughs> um, so this is just a shot from one of our houses from a barn. Same thing. You know, I think everybody who's builders and architects know what salvage flooring looks like. It's beautiful. Um, you know, really nice stuff. High value. So, so it's profitable to, to do things like deconstruct. So the other, the other um, framework we look at is biomimicry. And the, the key thing about biomimicry is um, the definition uh, is consciously emulating nature's genius. Um, from our perspective as builders, designers, architects, what it is is, um, again, it goes back to function. So you look at how other species are achieving the same function that you want to achieve in the place that you want to build, those, how those species you know, rely on certain things, say, for their survival, like heat regulation. And then you try to do the same thing you find out how they've done it, and you try to do something similar. Um, so you can also use biomimicry as a measure, quantifiably, uh, verifiably. Um, you can put a number to it. So engineers really enjoy that because it's a design standard. It's not just a model. It's not just aspirational. It's not just um, you know, something you try to attain and say, oh, okay, I feel good. I think I got you know, something that seems pretty biomimetic. You, you put numbers on it and see if you achieved them. And so for us, we try to, uh, you know, be an ecosystem engineer. There's a lot of research out there about other ecosystem engineers um, in nature. Keystone species, um, you know, keystone species, one that comes into the system, modifies the structural or the functional or the biotic or the abiotic part of the system in a way that creates opportunity and resources for other species that adds to the biodiversity to the site. So you could even say that uh, the original builders of the site that we built on 150 years ago were an ecosystem engineer when they came on the site and the way they, they took, you know, and they created an economy for themselves in terms of ice production and a mill that made, um, it was uh, cider and then also, uh, I always forget the other resource. But anyway, but anyway, so they created, they modified that system in a way that met their needs, their energy, energy needs and their living needs but also created more diversity for the surrounding community of uh, other species. And so that's what we try to do. Um, there's a lot of research on um, what it means to be an ecosystem engineer in natural systems. It, it, honestly, that part gets pretty dry, but the key takeaway is other systems do the same thing, other species do the same things we do. They're structural engineers, they're hydrological engineers, they're lighting engineers, they're excavators. We do the same things functionally. And that's where the common conversation is. It's in function. It's in actually when you go out to do the work, um, it's, it's function. It's not just aspirational. So this is how, say, beavers do it, for example. How they modify habitat, and then other species come into that system uh, because they find more resources for themselves, form a really uh, a more biodiverse community than would have existed had the beaver not come in. Uh, we try to do the same thing. So again, it's not literally trying to be a beaver. We're not out there with chainsaws or you know, trying to cut trees down with our hands or anything silly like that. But when we looked at this project, what we said was, OK, we have a 150-year-old limestone dam that's failing that needs to be replaced. 
uh, or um, repaired. So how can we do that? And how can we do that in a way that is going to enhance the biodiversity of the surrounding system? And so that's just uh, like our excavator and a few others trying to figure out some of the details of that. So the other thing we look at is uh, ecological technology, um, engineered ecosystems. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of Todd Ecological, but uh, that is a restorer. And so what that does, um, you know, the, it's basically you see it in the inset there. Um, we took, you know, I think 180-year-old cypress that was deconstructed out of a barn, uh, you know, about 20 miles away from the site. Cypress uh, grew in a very moist, humid uh, environment, so it's naturally resistant to rot. So there's no finish on that material at all. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, it was old-growth cypress. It had been in the barn for another 80 years, so it's, you know, 100, 150-year-old uh, lumber. But then there's also planting mats. And the planting mats is a biological com community whose roots go down into the water column and actually eat the detritus and the other biological nutrients that would, um, okay, five minutes, would um, fill the pond back in. And so as long as that system's maintained, that's going to keep the water quality, it's going to enhance the water quality, and it's going to protect that pond from filling itself back in in the future. So we also did a water wheel, salvage pavers from a roadbed. Um, the thing about microhydro is if you have a resource that runs continuously, it can be a much smaller system than, say, an intermittent resource like PV or wind. Um, so I'm not sure how that's performed. We haven't monitored that aspect of it, but it, it kind of puts back on the original site what was uh, once there. So I'll skip this one because we have just a few minutes left. But see, these are other examples um, of living machines. Actually, I'll go back for one second. This was what we wanted to put on the south side of the house. Um, we tried. What it does is there's a lot of diversity of um, solutions, of functions there. It purifies black water. It purifies gray water. It grows food. Uh, you could integrate fish farming. Uh, it helps indoor air quality. It, if you do it right, that's actually one of the undecided parts of it. At the top, it's a green roof, so it creates habitat for other species. It's integrated with the geothermal. That's a sand bank um, in a living machine ecosystem. You know, down below, it's designed to be passively survivable. So if all the energy and electricity fail, you can still uh, maintain a habitable uh, temperature and indoor environment for clients. Uh, you know, integrated PV in the windows. Really expensive, and the thing is, it doesn't have to look like a 200-year-old or a, you know, medieval conservatory. These systems exist elsewhere. That's the Omega Center um, down in Rhinebeck, New York purifies all the black and gray water for the Omega campus, um, returns it to uh, potable standards. Now, it's not used for potable purposes, but um, purifies. That's a, a smaller unit. It's basically just a greenhouse, a hoop house, where you integrate a living community to that. You can add a lot of function to projects at a, a relatively low cost. So I think, you know, just to wrap up, it comes down to, I think, as much value change for survival as it does to technology or products. It's about the choices and beliefs that we make as a geologic force when we step onto a system about what we're going to do, what, clears, what trees we might clear when we step on a site, what materials we might choose, how we're going to assemble those materials. I actually think most of the solutions that we need already exist, that we don't have to try to reinvent technology or, or, or you know, invest hundreds of millions of dollars into new technological systems, maybe in our big cities. Um, where some of the stuff doesn't scale so well or is difficult to scale, uh, you know, that's a different design challenge. But I think a lot of the values that we need, we once had. We may have forgotten a lot of those in time as it became easier with fossil fuel and bigger machines just to um, move faster and, and have a bigger impact. Um, that's downtown Syracuse in the early 1900s. Uh, you know, when you think about builders in that community constructed those two buildings, you know, back in the mid-1800s, again, that's a hard thing to imagine um, for at least me today to, to try to look at a project like that using the tools and technology they had available to them at that point. But values, what you believe matters. So I will leave it there, I guess, for any questions.